Amen. What a great opportunity we have to be in God's house this morning and to worship Him. And I'm so thankful that you are here with us this morning. Uh, a number of our families are, have uh, already left for holiday seasons or they're gone this weekend. So I'm grateful that we're able to be here together just worshiping together. I want to ask you this question, who are you? You may think, well, gosh, Paul, don't you know who I am? <laughs> But that's a question that we need to ask ourselves when we consider what this time of year is all about. Who are you? Because what we've been talking about these last couple of weeks is about the identity of Jesus Christ. How he himself proclaimed through statements that he made who he is in his identity. Now the amazing thing about it is there's going to be a question for you and I today. Who do we identify with? That's really, I guess, the question that we should ask ourselves. Who do you identify with? Because we could say a lot of things in this world, in this society, and the people that we have around us of who we identify ourselves with. But what we have to understand is even at Christmas, that God's word gives us a great picture of who Jesus is. And folks, let me tell you, as I've been studying, bless you, this series, that's my son. I know that sneeze. (laughs) Bless you, my child. (laughs) Where was it? Let me check my notes. (laughs) Oh, as I have been studying this series, it's an amazing thing for me to consider who Jesus is. And and to know that what Jesus did was for you and me. That not only that we've been given this gift, but that I may now identify myself with Jesus. That you, think about it, church, that you and I can identify ourselves with Jesus. And and the big question is going to be, who are you? Because when we begin to think about that, I'm, I'm be honest with you. I'm like, Jesus, there's no way, no way. But yet Jesus says, be holy because I'm holy. Do as I do. I have set you an example so that you could do also. All of these things that Jesus gives us is an amazing thing. And so when we come to this understanding of who Jesus is, we have to ask ourselves the question, who am I? Who are you? What do you do with your life now that you know who you are? So we're going to talk about identity. Now, when we consider Christmas, an amazing thing about it is knowing Jesus' identity as the Messiah the true Savior that comes to this world, that's born as a baby. It's an amazing thing. But, but let's just take consideration of some identity that's going on because sometimes life happens. <laughs> life happens and things happen in our life and we change and things change around us in our circumstances. And, and, you know, it's just hard sometimes to understand that and to grasp that. Take, for example, Mary. You know, as we celebrate Christmas and what Jesus did for us. You know, it always makes me think about all those involved in the Christmas story that we hear about. And think about Mary. Think about who she thought that she was, her identity. She was arranged and and planned and arrangements were being made for her to marry Joseph and it was going to be a wonderful thing. And then (laughs) the angel came and just blew that plan right out of the water. Her identity changed in a heartbeat. I mean, consider this, a teenager who was engaged to be married then all of a sudden this angel comes and says things are going to change in your life because you have found favor in God that alone would blow my mind you have found favor with God and then the amazing thing that the angel came and said oh yeah by the way you're going to become pregnant through the Holy Spirit and Mary says whoa Luke 1 tells us that's what she said whoa in I'm sure it's in Hebrew but it said that and she said how is this supposed to be because I'm a virgin And the amazing thing, if we look at this in Luke chapter 1, verse 31, it says this, that the angel said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary says, verse 34, how can this be? Whoa, (laughs) Since I'm a virgin. And the angel said in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Man, can you imagine? Her whole identity changed by what God was proclaiming to her 
about what was about to happen. But this very thing was prophesied about. This very thing is what they had been looking forward to, the coming Messiah that would change the world, that would save the world. And so what a a beautiful picture that we see about Mary is if we were to continue to read in that passage in Luke chapter 1 and to hear her song of praise and adoration. because Not because her whole world was turned upside down, but because she knew and believed. She believed in this new identity that had been given to her. And it changed who she was. Folks, sometimes we have to come to the grasp uh, and understanding of who we really are because you see identity is important because, listen church, identity is important because it causes us to act. If I'm going to be identified with a certain role, then I'm going to begin to act that way. If I'm going to be a teacher, then I'm going to start acting like a teacher. I'm going to train as a teacher. I'm going to do those things. If I'm going to become a parent, oh, there is no training that will help. Sorry. <laughs> No, seriously. But if we're going to do that, then how many of y'all that have new, I mean, gosh, we've, what was it, six babies that we had a baby dedication for here in November? Blows my mind. Church growth, yes. But the amazing thing about it is we try to prepare for those kind of things, so that becomes our identity. When we're in a relationship, what happens? We begin to act to secure that relationship and to make sure that everybody feels good about it. When we have a job, we want to put our identity in that so that we can be successful in all the things that we have. And so what we identify with causes us to act, to do something in our life. And the amazing thing about it is when we understand the identity of Jesus... And all that he has given us, church, it should cause us to want to identify with that. Let's let's think about the things that we've talked about in the identity of Jesus. When he said, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8, it was because he knew that in the darkness there was light. And in fact, in the context of what he said, remember, it was in the spirit and celebration of the light of God, which reminded and reflected upon the presence of God. God is with you. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He's saying, you don't have to be in darkness. When Jesus said, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd, it taught us about this idea that only through Jesus can we experience a relationship with God. And only through Jesus will we know what it's like to be cared for and comforted and protected and shielded and all of those kind of things that God gives us through Jesus when he said this. When Jesus said, I am the true vine in John chapter 15, it's an amazing thing because we identify with the source of life that Jesus said, I am now the vine. When Jesus said, I'm the bread of life in John chapter 6, it wasn't about being content with anything in this world. It was that we could have substance through the life that Jesus gives us. I am the bread of life. When he says that I'm the resurrection and the life, this was the midst of death. When Jesus, when his heart was broken for his friend Lazarus, and when he went and said, yes, I'm the resurrection and the life, but more than that, I have come to give you life, to redeem us. That's the identity of Jesus. And when we associate with that identity, when we want to be like Jesus, when we believe that Jesus really is who he says he is, then we begin to take on that identity in our life as we act, as we do the things that God has called us to do. So I'm going to ask you this question. What do you really have to do with Christmas? You say, well, I have a whole list that I gave Santa. I'm getting all the presents. That's a lot. That's Christmas. Christmas is presents, is it not? Christmas is getting together. We're all going to cook. We're going to eat, 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 and be merry. And this idea that we come together to celebrate the love that God has given us. God's given us love. So what do I have to do about Christmas? I can love, I can give, I can receive, and I can eat. Huh. Is that it? What do you have to do with Christmas? We have to understand the identity of Jesus himself when he came in the form of a baby so that you and I can know who is Jesus and who am I when it comes to Christmas. And that's what brings us to our text today. You see, sometimes in the busyness of all the world, you and I have to stop. I came across this in a devotion I was reading, and I just want to read it with you because it hit me right between the eyes. It says this, If I stop long enough, I see a love so extravagant, so lavish, so relentless, that it broke into the darkness of the world that Christmas morn. A love so unfailing, so divine, that it continues to pour down on us today, soaking us in His grace, plunging us beneath the fountain of His love. Christmas 
is the love story of God who loved us enough to send His one and only Son to the earth. It is the story of God who would humble Himself and give us His throne for a trough, give up His throne for a trough in a stable. Listen to this. But when I truly pay attention to my world, I do see God's grace upon us moment by moment. In the smile of a baby, in the warmth of a hug, in an answer to prayer, in the glimpse of a glorious sunset, in the nourishment of his word, in a really great homemade meal, and of course, in Christmas. What do you see the identity of Jesus in Christmas? Who do you see as Jesus in Christmas? You say, well, Paul, it's Christ must. It means that Christ Christ is with us. Yes, Scripture teaches us that His very name, Emmanuel, God with us, that we sing about that He was born, giving up heaven, heaven coming down upon us. But who do we really say? Who do we identify with when it comes to Christmas? And we have to understand that purpose of Jesus Himself. And that brings us to our text today, Jesus' identity and Christmas. And it's an amazing thing when we begin to look at this. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 14, and we're going to look at this text where Jesus gives us this great statement of, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the amazing thing about this, I want us to get the context of what Jesus is saying. As we've done this before in the I am statements, to understand what Jesus is telling us so that we can apply that to our life. Now, when Jesus gets to this point in his ministry. In fact, in John chapter 13, verse 1, it says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knew his purpose and identity was to come into this world so that he may die in this world. And not just die because that's not where the story ends but to be raised again so that he may experience life, so that we may be able to experience life. And he lives his life on this earth to help us understand his identity so that we may associate with that and experience the life that he gives us. There is no other way that we could experience true life except through Jesus. Why? Because that's what he says. And that's what I believe. I could choose not to believe it. I could choose to turn my back on what God has given us. I could choose to say that that's not what I'm going to be identified with. So it's a choice that you and I have to make to believe who Jesus is, to believe that Christmas is about Jesus, but not just his birth, but it's about his death, burial, and resurrection just as well. So when Jesus comes to this point in his ministry, in his life, he realizes that his his hour is about to come to end. So what does he do? What does Jesus say to his disciples? What does he do to his disciples so that they may know that they can be okay when he's gone? He washes their feet. Hmm. It's not something I would want to do. I mean, I love y'all, but some of your feet. But this is what Jesus did to identify himself with the very role and purpose that he has. He surrendered and humbled himself just as he came to this earth to wash the disciples' feet. This was the moment where Jesus realized, I'm going to be gone. Something's going to happen, and this is what he's doing. He's washing the disciples' feet. And yet in this time also, in John chapter 13, it talks about that Jesus says that somebody's going to betray me. We know it's Judas. He says, hey, I love you guys, but somebody's going to betray me. No, not I. (laughs) That's what you and I would say. It's in there. It's in Hebrew. But again, Jesus also says to Peter, you're going to deny me. These are the very people that walked with Jesus, who thought they knew Jesus, who understood Jesus' plan. They thought, but yet they didn't realize. So in the midst of all this, Jesus knows that he's about to leave. And then he's trying to share with his disciples by showing them an example of love and humility that he's not going to come as a king. He's going to come as a servant. And sacrifice himself. And as people are going to buy into what all this world is saying and betray the very name of Jesus and identity and purpose of who he is, he's still going to do it, this thing. And then he comes to this point in John chapter 14 where he brings comfort to the people, to his disciples. And he says, 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, we've heard this passage before. I've even used it a number of times to help with families and even to help me give encouragement and support to the idea that when death comes, that there is something more. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus knew his days were numbered. And he was trying to share with the disciples part of who he is. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then we have this incredible response from Thomas. Thomas Bless his heart, like many of us. I can relate to Thomas. He says in verse 5, Jesus, how can we know the way? You say we're supposed to know the way. Well, how are we supposed to know the way? And then this is the response that Jesus gives us in verse 6, where we get our statement today. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is making his claim to the idea of his identity in the midst of leaving his disciples, leaving this world, knowing that his purpose was coming to a completion. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Why? Because Jesus knew that he was the only way to eternal life. Jesus knew that he was the truth to stand upon. When everybody else was saying, don't believe this, when everybody else was saying, you don't know, you shouldn't follow this Jesus, you shouldn't live that way, don't identify with Jesus. And then Jesus also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the amazing thing about it is after Jesus says this, then we see where Jesus actually does go to sacrifice himself on the cross for our sins so that we may, through his death, our sins may be paid for, and through his resurrection, we might have life to be able to associate with Jesus. But it's all in how you believe. What is your identity? Who are you? What do you have to do with Christmas? So Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And it's not a matter of just being able to have this comfort and say, oh, I put on the label of being a Christian. No, but to identify with who Jesus is as the way, the truth, and the life. To know that Jesus said this as a statement of his identity. And then when we accept that identity, when we have Jesus in our life, when we ask him to come into our life, when we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, then the amazing thing about it is the identity of who Jesus is now comes to be a part of our life. Who that should blow your mind, because it does mine. Folks, when we come to the point of uh, knowing this world that we live in, all the things that we have to deal with, and yet in that, Jesus says, I'm still the way, the truth, and the life. If you just believe in me, he doesn't say you're going to have a perfect life. He doesn't say you're going to have the best relationship that you possibly can. It doesn't say that he's going to, that you're going to stop sinning in all of life. Who wouldn't that be a Christmas gift? No, but what he says is, Just believe in me because I am the life. I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm all that you need. But yet we also see in here where Jesus gives us a better understanding of his identity. Because not only does Thomas say, well, how can we know the way? You say we should know the way. How do we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But also we see sometimes that even our identity can be altered by the things that we see, our circumstances, the things that we go through. So many times we try to identify ourselves with what we have on this earth when we just need to understand what Jesus has done for us, what he has come to do, what he is trying to do in our life to redeem us. And this is why I want to just share with you three words to help us see Jesus for who he really is. Three words that I want you to understand. They're very simple. Number one, believe Number two, see. Number three, do. All right, if we do that, then we'll have a happy life. Let's just do it, church. Amen. Easier said than done, huh? And why is that? Because even the disciples struggled with it. Even the disciples, the ones who were following Jesus, the ones who were there with Jesus, who saw Jesus, who identified with Jesus, they struggled with this also. And you and I today, we don't have Jesus walking beside us, or do we? We don't have somebody to follow along and to hear them preach, or or do we? You see, that's where we really have to wrestle with this idea of who are we? Who are you? And what do you have to do with Christmas? It's the understanding of who 
Jesus is. Now let's look at our text because Jesus helps us to understand as he helped the disciples to understand. Because after Thomas had said this question and Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, he says in verse 7, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know me and have seen him. That you do know him and have seen him. And Philip in verse 8 of chapter 14 says this, Lord, show us the Father that we will, that that will be enough for us. (laughs) You see, the amazing thing about it is, Jesus says, verse 7, you've seen him. You have seen him. Because it was just ask, how are we supposed to know the way? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you know the Father, if you know me, then you know the Father because we are one and you know him and now you've seen him. And Philip in all his wisdom says, Lord, if you'll just show us a little more, we'll believe more. How many of us have said that before? God, if you'll just show me a little more of who you are, man, it would be a lot easier to believe you. God, if you just come down and fix it. No, God, if you'll just write it in the sky so that I can see it and say, see there, God says it, so we all should do it. But you know what? He already has done that through Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came in the form of a baby to be born and not just to live on this earth to show us the great lavish love of God, but to also show us the sacrifice of what it means to be humble under God, to believe or not to believe. To come to the point of understanding that Jesus did these things for you and I so that we may identify with who Jesus is. So therefore, we have Christ within us to be able to handle all the things that the world comes. To be able to see who Jesus really is. To know that God has given us this great gift of grace for us to live in every single day. Folks, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're struggling with. I know many of us in this room and in the early service, um, we could list out all the things that we struggle with, our anxieties, our problems, our secrets. Maybe some of us wouldn't want to put our secrets on paper, but you know what I mean. We all have those things in our life. And that changes how we see Jesus. That changes the identity that we see in Jesus because it changes how we see Jesus. We think Jesus is just this wonderful thing out there that we can say, oh yeah, on Sundays I'll associate with Jesus, but other days I won't. Oh yeah, on some days I'll associate with Jesus and be like him, but on other days I won't. You see, this is what causes us conflict in our understanding and faith to know. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way. When he said, I'm the good gate, I am the gate. He said it was only through the gate that we should enter the pen, and that being in a relationship with, G- with God himself. But when Philip says this, just show us. This is what Jesus said. When he said, Lord, show us. His answer in verse 9 said, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least just believe on evidence of the works themselves. Jesus says to Philip and to his disciples, listen, believe in me. And not only that, believe in me because when you do that, believe in the Father because the Father is in me. And if you can't even believe that, just believe the things that you've seen with your own eyes. You and I, church, can't see those things again a lot of times because we don't allow ourselves to see the work of God. Oh, Paul, that's kind of harsh. But let's be real, though. Let's be real, church. Because sometimes when Jesus says, this is who I am, we don't want that. We don't want to allow Jesus to come into our hearts because it changes everything about us. It changes what we feel about ourselves. It changes our perspective. It changes our identity. To say that we're going to associate with Jesus means that we're going to be like Jesus. That way, all listen church, let's just be real and honest. All the things that we have in our life, all the things of this world, all the things that we're experimenting with, all the things that we have in this life, we give up. Why? Because we identify with Jesus who died on the cross for our sins to give us real life. This life that we're living is not going to last. This life that we're living is not going to provide the satisfaction. This is not the way because it's not the truth and it is not the life that Jesus has for us. 
But you see what happens when, when Jesus begins to say, you see the Father because you see the Father in me. The question comes up, do you believe Jesus is the true Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus is the true identity of the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior? Then why do we not live? Because if we identify with that, identity causes us to act. So if we're going to do that, then one of the most important things for us to understand is through our identity, we now are going to be motivated to act. So if we say we believe in Jesus, then we should live like we live in Jesus. But the problem is sometimes we don't allow ourselves to do that. But Jesus goes on. He doesn't just stop there. In verse 12, he continues on. He says, very truly, I tell you. This means Jesus says, hey, this is important, so please listen. Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. You see, Jesus is saying, listen, if you believe in me, you are going to do things because I am going to the Father. But if you believe in me, there's going to be incredible things that you're going to do. Jesus says even greater things. Wow. Jesus just... Performed miracles, fed thousands, brought people from death. He himself is going to die and then come again to walk on the earth, to ascend to heaven in an incredible way and say, I'm coming back to do it again. Do you believe? Do you really believe? Jesus says, if you believe, you're going to do incredible things. Only because we associate with who Jesus is. Because Jesus even says this in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And that is the spirit of truth. So here it is, folks. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What he was doing is telling us again his identity. Jesus is the true Messiah. Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the way for us to understand life. Jesus is truth in the midst of all the things that the world tells us we need to believe in. Jesus is who he says he is. The question is, do you and I believe? If this is what Christmas is all about, it's not just the birth. It's about who Jesus is, that he died on the cross for our sins so that we may experience this life that he has. Church, I do not want you just to go through this Christmas season and think, oh, this is a great time for us to be together. No, it's to celebrate this birth and identity of Jesus Christ and to know that through the Holy Spirit, this spirit of truth is going to come, that I may live in that and not that my life is going to be perfect, because let me tell you, it's not. I make mistakes all the time. I fail. I fail you as a church because I am not the perfect pastor. There are days that I struggle with my own identity sometimes, because I'm like, God, why can't you make it easier? I mean, I love people, but I hate working with people. Because... <laughs> You know what I'm saying, though. I love you guys. But just like I get on your nerves, I do things that you don't like. I mean, just ask my kids. They could make a whole list for things. There are things that we do just because we're human and we're people and we have this selfishness within us. But to know that in the midst of all that, Jesus is who he says he is. I believe that. I believe it enough that it causes me to act upon it. So every day, I have to be in God's word so that I may know, God, just give me a glimpse of who you are because I know there's going to be some darkness that I'm going to see today. There's going to be some things in my life that I'm not going to like. There are going to be uh, sorrows that I'm going to have to deal with in my heart. But God, just give me a glimpse of you. Lord, let me see you. I'm doing like Philip. God, just let us see a little more, and then we'll believe. And then Jesus says, in all his greatness, I've come that you may have grace. And in that grace, you may have life. And all it takes... 
church, is for you and I to believe in Jesus and who he says he is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. Let's pray.